class. Please be quiet. Any special message for all the kids watching at home? Stay out of trouble. Welcome to the RPG Academy Network presents Film Studies. Hello and welcome, class, to Film Studies from the RPG Academy podcast. I am Michael, and today we are going to be discussing the movie Clue. Clue was released in 1985. It was written by John Landis and Jonathan Lynn, and it was also directed by Jonathan Lynn. Uh, You may know some of the other movies that Landis has written, including Blues Brothers and American Werewolf in London. And Lynn was also the director of My Cousin Vinny, which I think is a fantastic movie. Uh, But let's take attendance and see who is going to be joining us today. Uh, Victoria, say hello. Hi, uh, I'm Victoria. I am from The Broadswords, a actual play D&D podcast. And where can people find you and your show if they would like to? They can find us on our website, thebroadswords.com, and pretty much any social media outlet at The Broadswords. Fantastic. And also with us today is Tracy. Tracy, say hello to everyone. Hey, how's it going? Doing very well. And uh, tell us who you are and where we can find you. Uh, I'm Tracy Barnett, uh, tabletop game designer and actual play podcaster. Uh, you can find all of my stuff at theothertracy.com. That's T-R-A-C-Y. Uh, same for Twitter. And that's about the only social media I actively use. Uh, so just a quick content warning. I don't think there's really anything in this movie that's crazy it is it is a product of its time and i think we'll probably talk about that a mm-hmm. little bit yeah uh, there there is some violence that's more comical than graphic but would either of you say there's any content warning Maybe it's just my perspective i think it's like pretty pg-13 to be honest yeah like i'm i'm in canada so i like we have a different rating system than in the u.s ours is a little bit more lax than what the u.s is um but I, a canadian audience would be totally fine with bringing their kids to this <laughs> yeah, I, this might even clock in at PG for today's yeah. standards. Yeah. So <laughs> true. Uh, and then explicit language. I don't anticipate that we will, but if we have an occasional mess up, that's okay. I'll either cut around it, bleep it out, or I'll just put the content warning on the episode. <laughs> so we'll start with. Uh, we want to give our sort of one sentence review tagline. So Victoria, I'm going to start with you on a rating scale of one to five. Unless you have a different rating scale in Canada, uh, <laughs> what would be your uh, tagline in rating for the movie? Okay, one being bad and five being good. Correct. Okay, well, I personally give this a five, um, and I would say it's rip roar and family fun. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. No, I love this movie. Oh uh, yeah, me too. All right, Tracy, what about you? Uh, I also give it a five, and I would say it is the best group of directed improvisers I've ever seen. Mm. And and my uh cutesy tagline is one plus one plus two plus one equals five stars <laughs> <laughs> so if anyone is not familiar with the movie clue what have you been doing with your life uh yeah. but uh it is based on the popular board game is this is this the first instance of board games being turned into movies i know we have like battleship now and there's uh there's a couple others that are coming out but is this the first instance i I think it probably is. Um, Maybe. We'll go with yes. Challenge us, Internet. Come at us. Yeah. So it's based on the popular board game. Uh, it is a comedy. Uh, there's a dinner party hosted by Mr. Body, and where it comes out that he has been blackmailing all the visitors and guests who have been given aliases such as uh, Mrs. Peacock, Miss Scarlet, Mr. Green, uh, Mrs. White. And then when Mr. Body turns up murdered, all of the guests are now suspects and they must work together to try to figure out who is the killer. Now, when I brought this up to to you two about doing it, both of you were very vocal that you have watched this movie many times. You love this movie, Victoria, more than than anyone I know. Uh, So I'll start with you. You love this movie. What is it about this movie you enjoy so much? Like, why is it such a, a thing you treasure? Uh, well, this is it, it. It's nostalgia. A lot of it is. Um, my mom was a big Tim Curry fan, so growing up, this film we saw it as a family, like on, on VHS at home in the basement in the den. And uh, but it just quickly became one of those movies that my brother, sister, and I would just watch all the time. And it, like it was like a weekly occurrence. We would just watch this, The Goonies, and Watcher in the Woods. 
And this was this was just one of those that we just watched. And we thought it was a lot of fun because when you're a kid, there's a lot of slapstick humor. Uh, it, like the, the dog poop entrance <laughs> scenes when your children are really great. Those are yep. fun. Um, and then, you know, just like the goofy music when they're running around trying to uh, deduce what's going on. And then, of course, with the VHS, you have all the multiple possible endings. Mm -hmm. So that is fun. And then and we played a lot of Clue as kids. So the, just the tie in for that. Yeah, I, uh, I I also played a lot of Clue. I, I don't know that it's one of my top games anymore, but mm -hmm. uh, as a youth, I really enjoyed it. And uh, I want to touch on the fact that there were multiple endings. I I I don't know of any other movie that has done that. Uh, I mean, in, in today's spoiler culture and and uh, you know abundance of news sites that cover movies, I don't know that if, if movies could get away with it. Mm -hmm. But in the original theatrical release, there was a random ending put onto each movie, and there's three endings total. From what I remember, that didn't go over very well. People didn't like that. I do think it caused some problems because I think the idea is that people would be talking to each other about, hey, you know, that end of that movie was so funny when so and such happened. And they're like, that's not how it happened. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it would encourage people to then investigate and maybe watch the movie an additional time or two to, you know, I, I think it was a cutesy way to, I think, to maybe try to create some conversation. Uh, maybe it's like the first attempt at viral marketing. <laughs> From what I understand, it did go over very poorly and actually ended up hurting overall box office more than helping it. But this mm -hmm. movie became mm -hmm. a cult classic on VHS and DVD. And, and so I think it yeah. over time eventually made up its money that way. But all those endings are now part of the one movie. You don't have to watch it three times. It's They're all kind of edited together and it'll do the, but that's yeah. how it could have happened. And you see the rest of it. So what about you, you Tracy? Mm -hmm. Obviously, you said you also like this movie. What is it about it that you like so much? Um, so it's partially nostalgia. Um, we've like my sisters and I first saw this movie uh, sometime in the the early to mid '90s when we found it at our local video store and we watched it once. And like Victoria, we were just hooked. Um, we we would watch it probably once once a, every other month or so, and. You know, we got to the point where we could quote lines to each other, and the, there's something about the how all those actors play off of each other that is just dynamite. And I did a, a little bit of research on it a, a, a little while ago, and that's why this was part of my tagline. So much of that movie was improvised; like they had a basic script that they that they they knew what they needed to do and where they needed to go and what they needed to say, but like. Some of the most iconic moments from it, like Mrs. White's flames on the side of my face, breathing breathless. I hated her so much. It, it, the, it, flames, flames, flames on the side of my face, breathing breathless. Breathing. That was all just uh, Madeline Kahn going off the cuff. Like, none of that was in the script. And you can, if you're watching with that in mind, you can sort of see when they're in those moments and they're just sort of riffing off of each other. And it works so well because if you don't know that that's the case, you're just like, oh my gosh, this is a really quirky movie. You know, um, mm -hmm. but just that that entire group of actors has such good comedic timing that they could have probably gone any number of directions. I'd love to, to see an outtakes reel. I know they didn't really wow. record those in, yeah. in like 84, 85, but if there were like an extended, just like cutting room floor mm -hmm. reel of Clue, I there would be just gold in there. Oh, yeah. I absolutely, I would pay a lot of money to have mm -hmm. an extended edition with all kinds of outtakes and bloopers. That would be incredible. Mm -hmm. And I, I kind of glossed over it a little bit, but this movie at the time, it was it was an ensemble cast and it was all these people who were very well known and, you know, famous, I guess, actors and actresses in their own disciplines. Uh, obviously, Lee, or Tim Curry, who, mm -hmm. I mean, is just a comic genius. I, I love pretty much everything he's ever been in. Uh, he is an amazing actor. I guess it was. He passed recently, I believe. Um, I've got the IMDb page up here. So for people who don't know it's eileen brennan tim curry madeline khan christopher lloyd michael mckean martin mall leslie ann warren colleen camp and lee ving those are like the the top 
top bills. And, and Lee Vang actually um, is a punk rock musician. He, is he the one who actually played Mr. Body? Yeah, he's Mr. Body. And um, he uh, was the frontman of the L.A. hardcore punk band Fear. Hmm. He's only in three movies. He was in Flashdance, <laughs> Streets of Fire, and Clue. <laughs> okay. I Wait, did you just say Tim Curry passed away? I thought so. Mm-hmm. Am I wrong I about that? I don't think so. I think he's very much alive. Um, I think he's 72 years old. I saw. Is he? Did he have like a stroke recently, or has some sort of bout of illness? Because I thought that I saw something. So hold on. A I thought he had. Okay, no. Dead or alive. dot com. Dead or alive. Info. dot com says he is still alive. Yeah, I, good. I, he, I had he, thought he had passed too. Oh, good. Yeah. No, I was very shocked. I'm like, mm, I, I had to do some googling. <laughs> well, I, I, I may be thinking of someone else. So I'm very happy to report that I was incorrect and Tim Curry is still alive because I, I think he is a national treasure. I love that man, and uh, I'm so glad that he's not God. Uh, so this movie is chock full of very excellent actors. So if you had to give an MVP, who would it be, Tracy? Oh, um, I am. Like Tim Curry is the is the obvious easy answer, right? Because uh, as Wadsworth, he carries the movie. Like he he is the driving force behind everything happening in the movie. But I am going to probably actually give it to Michael McKean, yeah, because he plays Mister Green, who as well when we talk about the content and everything in this movie being a product of his time, the reason he's being blackmailed is because he's a, a closet homosexual, and. It's played for laughs, of course, because this was 1984 and 1985, but he's, his character is very uptight and very uh, nervous, and he plays it in such an understated manner, and when he does get loud, it's the exact perfect amount of, of loudness. There's a, a, a goof that I am relatively certain was not planned, where he's leaning on like a sideboard, and it just breaks. And he falls down in the middle of <laughs> like uh, this big conversation, and probably because partially due to editing, no one even bats an eyelash. He just sort of has to sort of get up and brush himself off. But like he just does such a good job of being this quiet, not unobtrusive character. You always know he's there, but he's never over the top, except in those brief moments when he is. And and also he's I mean in the real ending he's the hero of all of it so yeah all right what about you Victoria oh that's very difficult um because they all they all bring something to yes. to the movie um so yeah Tim Curry again he 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 is the glue but I would say uh, Christopher Lloyd and Eileen Brennan I like their dynamic in the being uh, Mrs. Peacock and Professor Plum. I, I really like their dynamic in the film, and I love the running gag of them really not liking each other mm-hmm. um, and the constant sniffs and ughs of Miss Peacock when it comes to Professor Plum and him just egging her on. And in the dining room with like the spoons and the slurping of the soup, that is one of my favorite scenes, and... Yeah, Miss Peacock and I ramble. Miss Peacock rambles. So so that that's a big one for me. Okay. Uh as for myself, I'll echo what both of you have said that it's it's hard not to give it to Tim Curry. He is absolutely the obvious answer and he does a phenomenal job with this. But I also, along with Tracy, would say it's Michael McKeon. I mm-hmm. thought his performance is incredible. I think he has some of the best moments, uh scripted and unscripted moments. And again, product of this time, unfortunately, him being a closet homosexual is played for laughs. I don't think, it, like in my mind, if, in, if if we were going to make a movie today about a movie that was made in that time, he would be very van flamboyant and over the top. But this was very reserved, which was his character. And it's unfortunate that that's what some of the laughs come from. But they were written in a way that actually worked very well, I thought, uh, in particular when everyone is sort of talking about miss uh, scarlet mm-hmm. and it's just very subtle it's like me you know like all the other mm-hmm. men were all like you know you know dogs and heat tongues wagging and they kind of come to him he's like me you know it's, it's like yeah. a subtle <laughs> thing but i thought it was played very well but my yeah. absolute favorite moment 
And I don't know why, but I absolutely love this. There's there's one of the scenes, I think it's near the end, where they're going through all the different scenarios, and uh, Wadsworth throws uh, Mr. Green into the bathroom. <laughs> yep. And a few minutes later, he comes out, he's just washing his hands. Yeah. It, I don't know why that makes, it just makes me laugh so hard every yeah. time. Yeah, you just hear the, the toilet flush, <laughs> and he walks out. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that leads me to a question, if you don't mind me going off book of course, a little bit, Michael. Of course. What is your favorite comedic moment in the movie? Because I have one, it's it is the my is for me the absolute best moment. I'm curious what yours are. I think mine has to be again that coming out of the bathroom, washing his hands. I just think that's gold, brilliant. Uh, we'll go to Victoria next. We'll let Tracy count it in. What 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 would be yours if you could come up with one? Uh, Mrs. White in the kitchen. Uh, one they've discovered the the dead cook. And uh, Mrs. White says, men should be like Kleenex, soft and disposable. <laughs> I... The blackmail, how many husbands have you had? Mine or other women? Yours. Five. Five. Yes, just the five. Husbands should be like Kleenex, soft, strong, and disposable. That has been my favorite line since I was a kid. And I, I'm, for me, that was dead on, just the way she says it very quickly. Mm-hmm. And it's very kind of slightly glossed over, like they quickly move to something else. And it's just one of those moments where you're like, <laughs> and, and you go on. And that's my favorite. All right. So, Tracy, you, you wanted to, we set you up. What is it? Uh, the singing telegram girl. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is that moment when I first watched it that my jaw just dropped open and I like shout laughed because... Yeah. The timing is just perfect. It's like the house is dark. The door pops open and you hear da 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 da. And then <laughs> the the timing of when the gunshot comes in is exactly in line. It's just a split second ahead of the beat of what she's singing. Da 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 da. I am your singing telegram. And just it's just done stunningly well like that 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 is the moment that sticks out for me i mean it's there's so many it's you Mm -hmm. know anyone Mm -hmm. you could pick would be your favorite and maybe tomorrow i might have a different answer my brother sister and i we reenacted that telegram scene many times Mm -hmm. as kids that was something that we we enjoyed doing yeah we we were at our our rewind button (laughs) <laughs> just going back and watching that over and over and over again, which sounds kind of morbid um, when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, now that I dissect the fact that we were watching a woman get shot <laughs> at, in a doorway after, you know, in her little bellboy uniform. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the things we found funny as children and still find funny because uh, you, you mentioned, I think it was Victoria, about how like when you're a kid, the, the poop on the shoe joke is hilarious. Mm-hmm. It's hilarious to me. And I'm 43 years old. I still laughed at that watching it again recently. It's like oh, it's it's just so funny. Again, I just love how everything is like underplayed. Mm-hmm. You know, everything is just sort of like subtle reactions where people are just like you know checking their own shoes and they they don't want to say anything. Mm-hmm. I, just, I don't know. It <laughs> makes me makes me laugh. So obviously, we all love this movie. Mm-hmm. Do you think this is a movie that for someone who plays tabletop role playing games is either something that they should watch because of playing tabletop role-playing games or just should they watch anyway in general even if they're not gamers <laughs> so is there anything about it that you think is specifically good or ideal for someone who plays role-playing games that it, they could, there's something they could take from it so i'll start with you again tracy well in general it's one of those movies where if someone says yeah i haven't seen it i have no idea what it is my first reaction is oh my god when can we watch it <laughs> um like that that's immediate and if it comes up in like our group of friends it's always like clue yeah i could watch clue you know so i think just in general it's it's a good movie to know just because of of how underplayed but unrelentingly funny it is um in terms of of tabletop i I've, I've been thinking about this since i rewatched it and i'm not sure that there are for me direct takeaways like there there's nothing like hey you can plot your game like this because the plot is relies on there being a character in the know the entire time um and that seems to be wadsworth right from from the jump um even as that has twists and turns or mr green you know in in the in the final ending but for for a game scenario like this to do a who done it when you don't know who done it i think is uh 
something I would like to see happen at a game table, but I think it would take a lot of player buy-in. Um, I tried to do this once at, uh, for a birthday party, right? To do a murder mystery where everyone was a suspect and the detective character had to figure out who was the actual killer when the players themselves didn't know who the actual killer was and they could have been the killer, any one of them. And it took so much cognitive load to try and do sneaky things, but the way I had it set up is if you do a certain number of sneaky things or shady things or um, suspicious things, you would ultimately, whoever did the most would, would ultimately be the killer. But that one is not terribly satisfying. And two, it requires the players to go like, well, do I want to be the killer? Do I not want to be the killer? How many sneaky things do I have to do? How many is that person doing? And that's a lot of like mental work to do when you're trying to play a character and also grok an rpg system we were using gumshoe for it at the time in terms of like game stuff that's that's where i come down on it their only thing i think that could be a direct takeaway is to if you know that most of it is improvised watch how they play off of each other because you can see them saying yes and to each other Mm -hmm. without saying yes and where they just like roll from one thing into another, into another, into another. And it literally takes the editor cutting the camera away to the next shot for that to stop. Because Mm -hmm. they, I suspect in a lot of cases, they probably just kept vamping, you know, after that. They probably just kept bouncing back and forth off each other, getting more and more ridiculous. And so the editor had to just be like, okay, we're going to cut that scene there (laughs) and move on to the next bit. Um, But they, they all support each other character wise even though their characters are at least to a mild degree antagonistic throughout the entire thing there's there's no pair of characters that is actually on the same side throughout the entire movie everyone is out for themselves because they're all being blackmailed they all are possible murder suspects because when the light goes out and mr body is found dead who done it we don't know who done it until the end and then we find out who done it all right, so what about you, Victoria? Same question. I think there are some things that you can take away. Uh, and this is funny because maybe about two, three days um, before you asked me to, to be on this show, I actually purposely used something from Clue in a game. So I started actually a D&D game. I started uh, Tombs of Annihilation with some friends. And for the opening first session, all the players meet at this person's house and it's a they you know it's a module so they give you what's supposed to happen and i i looked at that and i said i can make that a little bit more fun uh so what i did is i purposely took the clue intro of how everyone arrives one by one they're brought into a room and then they have to start interacting and improvising with each other and role playing with each other as each person is introduced. So I decided to use that introduction system for everyone coming in to, because Tomb of Annihilation is essentially solving a mystery. That That's what this module is, is you're, you have to go and, and solve this curse. So these people are coming in one by one, and then so it really encouraged role play. It really encouraged everyone diving into their character from the get-go. And then everyone could start establishing who their character was and start creating these relationship dynamics with each other. And we that ended up lasting um, about an hour. And it was great. It was a lot of fun. And later on, when I touched base with everyone and asked them how the session went... They all said my favorite part was the beginning when we just got to meet each other and be introduced to each other and start role playing with each other. So I think um, that opening scene, those opening scenes from Clue can be very useful, particularly when you're starting a new game. That's good stuff. (laughs) It was a lot of fun. And I, so, so talking about murder mysteries, I've hosted murder mystery dinner parties at home. I've written some for myself, for friends. Um, and this is also something I grew up with as well. A lot of my birthday parties were murder mystery birthday parties as a kid. My mom would write these murder mystery birthday parties for kids, um, mainly because my birthday's in February, so it's kind of cold. You can't like do fun stuff outside. 
So she would come up with fun things to do inside. And so it would be all of us with little notebooks. And my mom would place clues around the house. And my dad would always be the body, the dead guy, usually <laughs> with a name like Humperdinck. Everyone would find him laying down on the ground in the in the family room. And then there's clues around and we would have to figure out who was the murderer. And one of us could have very well have been the murderer. And there were certain scenes that my mom would set up and she would say. So this is something I grew up with. So with my friends, um, one of them could be the killer. They don't know if they're the killer or not. They have to put two and two together. Everyone has to put two and two together. And I think that can translate to to the tabletop game. But you do have to have people who are willing, like you said, Tracy, to buy into that. And it is improv, but I think what I wouldn't make one of the players the detective. I would I would do that as the GM mm -hmm. and I would kind of keep them the flow going as the GM playing those NPCs. Um, and, and maybe even setting some of the scenes. And I'm a really big, um, advocate of collaborative storytelling. Mm -hmm. So while I would have certain clues or certain things that needed to be hit, I would set that scene up and say, okay, player one, player two, you are in this room. This happens. Go. Mm -hmm. And then see what they come what they come up with. And then I would use that in the ultimate mystery. So I, I, I do think you can use this, but I think it really needs to have buy-in and it does need a more of a collaborative play style. Okay. So as for myself, overall, this is a movie that I use to find my tribe. If I say, Hey, if you watch the movie clue, they're like, Oh my God, I love that movie clue. We are instantly friends. <laughs> if they've never seen clue, then I will, make them watch it so we've become instantly friends. If they're like, yeah, I didn't really care for it. Yeah. Probably not going to work out between us. Cause mm -hmm. I just think this, this is a movie, my age at the time it came out, my sense of humor is so ingrained in this type of humor that yeah, absolutely. If you like this movie, I like you period. End of story. As far as role-playing games go, I again, agree with both of you. I think there are elements that can be taken. I too have used it as a basis of several games. I'm, I'm a big murder mystery DM, I love to do them, though they rarely work out very well because of some of the issues you've both brought up. But I love trying them. And I currently have a, a game that I run at conventions. It's my Scooby-Doo Dread game, which is basically Scooby-Doo meets Clue. Like, that is absolutely what the movie is. Uh, it's been 20 years since the gang broke up when Scooby died. And all the other characters, Fred, Velma, Shaggy, Daphne, get a letter that says, I know who killed Scooby-Doo. Meet at this house at this time. And they show up and it's storming. And there's a, a, a butler there who sort of sets things up. And then things happen and they spend the rest of the game walking around the house trying to find out who actually killed Scooby-Doo. It is 100% ripped off of Clue. Even when I describe like the room or the, the outline of the house, it's what I remember off of Clue, you know, the walk in, the entryway, the closet, everything as I, I'm, I kind of do it free form, but I do it from my memory. having watched Clue so many times. If I were to do it in a quote unquote serious style game, I, I like to follow the trope where there's actually a detective or someone there who has the authority to actually try to solve the crime and then merit punishment, but they're not very good at their job <laughs> or they have leapt to conclusions that are putting them on the wrong trail and the players are there to uh, to assist them either knowingly or maybe unknowingly. So they you know it could be a game where they literally say this person said they did this. They couldn't have been the killer because of XYZ or they might be going in front of them and leaving clues trying to get the detective on the right trail. Uh, so that way you don't have to have the issue where the players do or don't know anything. They're there to facilitate someone else's success, but they still get to do all the work. But for me, the biggest aspect is what Tracy said at the very beginning, where there was a script, but so much of the movie is improvised. So much of the gold of this movie is just letting the characters be them, the players and characters be themselves and interact together and wait for that magic to happen. So as a DM, I can have a very loose structure. I know at the ball, there's going to be a scream and a body will be found. I will. I know that it's probably one of these three people. I know each what maybe what their motivations are. And I just let the character start doing stuff. And as things happen, I go, okay, it seems now like it's more likely this person. 
Oh, no, now it seems it's more likely this person. And then I'll just figure out who it makes the most sense to be when we get to the point where the reveal makes the most sense. Uh, and I think that would be a good way, maybe not the best way, but a good way to make a, the mystery happen. But absolutely, as you both have said, you have to have player buy-in. Mm -hmm. When the characters are introduced in the movie, there are certain times where certain characters will meet each other and there's a visible reaction or a huff. And there's even one part where Wadsworth says, oh, do you know each other? And, and both the characters, are, you know, somewhat deny it or acknowledge uh, some sort of small, you know, uh, relationship. In a D&D &D game, it's very often that someone will go, yes, this person's blackmailing me. I stab him in the face. <laughs> you, you can't have a movie that builds if you don't buy in to say, okay, we're playing a mystery. These things are going to come out eventually, but I don't need to stab someone in the face five minutes into the game because then we've lost everything we were trying to build. Mm -hmm. Players need to know what their role is in that particular scene and, and be okay with saying, you know, my character is the stab you in the face guy, but tonight I'm going to be the wait till later stab you in the face guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. So again, we love this movie. Is there anything about it that uh, could be better? Any critiques, criticisms of the movie even possibly looking at it through a lens of 25 years ago. So I'll start with you this time, Victoria. Anything about the movie that doesn't quite work for you? Well, I, I think some of the jokes are dated. We've, we've already touched on that uh, with Mr. Green. Um, and and the way, you know, in this is how it really happened. And his final line of, I'm going to go home and sleep with my wife. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, okay, so he was a plant the entire time. And I get it. Um, but I think that trivializes kind of the character himself a little bit too. So th there is that. Then, and I think some of some of the jokes at times are a little sexist. Mm -hmm. Again, but I mean, the the film's older, so I just kind of go with the flow for that one. Um, they're not as bad as some other films um, from that time period, which can be really, really bad when you watch it. Very cringy. This one, because I think it has so much campiness to it, uh, you, I end up forgiving it a bit because of that. And Tracy, what about you? I pretty much fall into the same, into the same categories as Victoria. I think that the sort of inherent homophobic attitudes towards Mr. Green's character are very much a product of their time. Um, although I, I do appreciate how in the beginning and with the, the first two endings, when you, when he is not revealed to have been a plant the whole time and actually not be gay, um, he's not bothered by the fact that he's gay at all. And mm -hmm. I think for 1985, that's that's a, a stronger position than a lot of movies would take, so that's pretty cool. Um, mm -hmm. But there is casual sexism throughout the entire thing. Um, pretty much, uh, well, uh, the uh, Yvette, the the maid, is yeah. literally just there to be cheesecake. And I think Miss Scarlet, uh, although a sex worker and just like Mr. Green, not ashamed of it in the slightest. There's there's just a lot of stuff surrounding that that reinforces, well, this is how men are and so on and so forth. So um, I, I think that those things uh, definitely could could be handled better. But again, 1984, 1985, that's definitely a product of their time. Um, beyond that, I don't it's probably just my love of it speaking, but I don't have a whole lot of more criticisms about it beyond that uh, and like victoria said there are movies where those things are a lot worse and a lot more blatant and mm -hmm. can't be overlooked and like you're not going to watch it again um this isn't one of those i don't think i agree with both of you uh, again as i started at the top there's it's a product of its time that really should be forgiveness but i just i love the movie so much i grew up watching it that again i i kind of have to give those a pass whether I have to or not, I do because I love the movie so much. But they're there, and I, I, you know, I think for the time they are not nearly as bad as they could have been, and so I appreciate that aspect. the The one other sort of criticism I would give is I'm, I'm actually not a huge fan of Mr. Body's performance. Um, <laughs> he's a bit stiff, pardon the pun. And I, uh, there's a couple moments that they only work because they're scripted. The fact that um, Professor Plum didn't recognize that he wasn't dead when he checked his pulse. Mm -hmm. I mean, sure, he's not really a, a, that type of a doctor, but 
everything we believe is based on the fact that he's supposed to be dead and then later he's not dead. And I even question like what exactly like how exactly does the whole like it doesn't always it doesn't make a lot of sense to me when you actually break down why Mr. Body is there, who Mr. Wadsworth is, their relationship. It's he's very antagonistic when he walks in. He's like, I don't want, you know, I don't want to be here. I'm not gonna eat the soup. Who are you? He's not playing his role. So then it makes me think, well, why is he there? Is he also being black, by, blackmailed by Wadsworth to be there? And then the whole thing, like, let's all kill Wadsworth. I, it, some of it just doesn't quite, like, I don't, maybe I'm just not smart enough to figure it out exactly. I'm always like, that doesn't quite make sense. But once you get past that, it's great. But I think there's there's some force set up, which mm-hmm. maybe goes back to as an RPG, you just kind of have to buy into that and not worry about it too much. I, you know, I, now that you mention all of that, like, all that stuff is completely 100% true. And I think just like a, a first session of an RPG where you have to bring everybody together somehow, like I'm so used to that, that I overlook all of that <laughs> now mm-hmm. because it's just how we do the thing that we do in tabletop games. Like you have to, there has to be that moment. And so because I love Clue so much and I love RPGs so much, I totally forget that the plot is thinner than paper <laughs> yeah i mean he's basically bringing great characters together and letting them go with just the thinnest barest hint of a plot or structure that's role-playing games mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. that's, like, that's what it is so i think professor plum was pretending that he was dead because he wanted to shoot him but does that really make sense though like not really because <laughs> he, he wants him dead does he want him dead so bad that he has to be the one to kill him because if he's pretending to be dead and then you go in with it, you give him a chance to get away. I mean, I, you know, if, if you get yeah. into their mind enough, you could kind of justify it. But I, I personally don't think it makes a whole lot of sense. Well, he did shoot him and I don't know. And he had the gun. So he created. Uh, yeah, yeah. It, it is a little weird. And Mr. <laughs> Body, Mr. Body is a is is stiff. But I think he he was a rock star right. guy. He wasn't, he wasn't he wasn't an actor. Yeah. Um, and. I don't even like how his character looks. Yes. Oh, he's so, greasy. So, like, sleazy. He's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Maybe there's a, a, a fourth ending that got cut where uh, <laughs> Mr. Plum, Professor Plum was in a conspiracy with Mr. Body to defraud everyone, and he had to be the one to kill him. Yada, I don't yada. know if Professor Plum's that smart. <laughs> oh, probably not, but... So um, we, we've kind of touched on it. There's, there's quite a few lines in this movie that we love. But if, if you had to pick your most quotable quote, what would it be? Flames on the side of my face, breathing, breathless, heaving breaths, heaving. <laughs> it, it's so out of nowhere. Like, you don't even expect that kind of reaction because Mrs. White is so staid the entire time. And most of her lines are so undercut. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the 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 close second follow up is also from her, where she just makes that ah! sound, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> which I'm no my octave is nowhere near Madeline Kahn, so there's no way that sounded exa- you know anything like her, her. But just those moments where the character's undertone of just like intensity comes out, it's it's really really well done. What about you, Victoria? Any, if, if what's the what's the one you quote the most? Uh, well, I I already mentioned it, but the whole the whole interaction because this is when Mrs. White is talking to Colonel Mustard in the kitchen, and he asks her how many husbands that she has had, and she clar- she asks for clarification, mine or other women's, <laughs> uh, and he says yours, and she says five. Husbands should be like Kleenex, soft, strong, and disposable, and you, he you use oh god. I, I can't remember the line, but it's about flies, right? Yes. He says, you, lo- you lure men to their deaths like a spider with flies. Flies are where men are most vulnerable. <laughs> That's uh, right. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, that that exchange is great. And also when Miss Mrs. White says, yeah, my husband just lies on his back all day. He's dead. So, of course, he does. <laughs> Oh, he wasn't a very good illusionist. Yes. Uh, they're, they're just so okay. Mrs. White's lines. Um, so yeah, everything Madeline Kahn says, I'm game. <laughs> so I I do quote the one plus one plus two plus one a lot. 
They, just like any time there's any sort of like disagreement, I'll just break into that. And uh, it's one of the bits that Caleb and I get into also, like because we disagree a lot on the show. We will go back and forth doing that whole bit back and forth several times. There was one shot at Mr. Body in the study, two for the chandelier, two at the lounge door, and one for the singing telegram. That's not six. One plus two plus two plus one. Uh-uh. There was only one shot that got the chandelier. That's one plus two plus one plus one. Even if you were right, that would be one plus one plus two plus one, not one plus two plus one plus one. Okay, fine. One plus two plus one. Shut up! But the, the line that I quote the most is, We'll stack the bodies in the cellar, lock it, leave quietly one at a time, and forget that any of this ever happened. I, I say that in almost every D&D game that I'm a player, because at some point in time, we do something horrific, and everyone's like, well, how are we going to get out of this? And that's my go-to line. So I quote that one <laughs> all the time. All right, so we've jumped around a little bit. We've kind of conflated a couple of the different sections, which I'm totally fine with. So if we were going to try to run this movie, or we're going to try to do a murder mystery, is there a specific game that we think it would work better in. So, I mean, I'm a, I play D&D most often. I do play some other games. So, Victoria, if you were going to run a murder mystery, is there a particular game that you're familiar that you think would work better than any other? And if so, why? I mostly play D&D. So that's the one I'm most familiar with. Uh, and I've run murder mystery games in D&D and they work fine. Um, especially when people have their investigation skills. I, I think there are skills that are or cater to that kind of thing. Um, but I, okay, I know this is weird, and I, but I think it would be kind of fun to play it in Star Trek Adventures. Um, because, I mean, it, the Star Trek Adventures is a collaborative-based game. The whole premise of that game is to work together as a team and and create a story. And I I think that would work really well. I think people's focuses uh, would work well for that sort of story. And who doesn't like a murder mystery in space? (laughs) Perfect. All right, Tracy, what about you? Um, My go-to for investigative games of any kind is something based on gumshoe, because I think that the that entire system's focus of you have a rating in this skill that means you automatically get a certain amount of clues that are in the scene um is fantastic and it it can definitely be ported over to other systems you know um but that entire ethos of the players will never lack the information they need to advance if the right character is is in the scene asking questions is great for an investigative game because too many games get stalled out because someone's like, well, I don't have a, a history skill, so I guess that's not going to happen. Um, you can always you can always try, right? You can. There's never not information, so that works really well, and and that's that's what I would lean toward. So uh, like Victoria, most of the time I play D and D. It's it is my favorite game, even if it's not the best game. I just I love it so much, and I do think that it can be totally acceptable to run games that way though to tracy's point i'm going to port in ideas and concepts so anymore when i run any sort of investigative type game whether it's a murder mystery or not i don't really have people roll to see if they get the clue they're going to get the clue they walk in the room they're going to see what i need them to see if they roll then i might give them additional information that helps contextualize it a little bit more like okay you found the knife it's underneath the dresser drawer but it looks like the dresser drawer has been you know, moved or the dresser has been moved. I'm not, and some of that I'll just mm-hmm. make up in the, in the moment, trying to make it a little bit more interesting or more confusing. So they're going to get whatever they need in any time they're in a room. But if they have a higher skill, if they ask the right questions or if they roll very well, I'll give them something additional that they can help them maybe solve it faster. But yeah, they're going to see what they need to see every time. I just, mm-hmm. For me, the murder mystery is much more fun as the player than as the character. Like when I go into combat, I don't expect my player to be able to swing a sword or cast a fireball. That's what the characters do. But when it's a murder mystery type thing, I expect the players to be the ones who are actually kind of behind everything. I think for me, that's Mm -hmm. more fun that way. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. So any last thing before we go into our sort of a wrap up section? I'll start with you, Tracy. Is there anything else about this movie or running murder mystery type games that you just think would be relevant people might want to hear? Uh, I mean, if if you're listening to this and you haven't watched it, I know that Michael won't be your friend if you don't like it. So that's a risk you're going to have to take. Right. But um, it's an hour and a half. It's a short movie. It's on Amazon Prime right now. It might be on Hulu or, or other services. Get some friends. 
uh, beverages of your choice and 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 watch it. It is it's not a it's not a good movie cinematically. Like it's a cult classic for a reason. It's a good movie because of all of those comedic interactions and all of the 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 beats that happen. Uh, so it's definitely worth your time uh, to give it a watch. All right, and Victoria. Yeah, just watch the movie because it's great and it's fantastic, and <laughs> that, that's all I have uh, because it's just awesome and you it, it needs to happen. And there's so many good quotes from it, and there are so many I think kind of references, pop culture references to this film, and the, it it plays off of a lot of tropes, but it does that very consciously. And it's just really fun. And especially as as tabletop gamers, those tropes are pretty much what we're about. I mean, those are what we play off of and those are what we emphasize in our games. So I, I think there's a lot of fun stuff to happen. And from an editor's perspective, there are a lot of comedic parts that with, when it comes to sound design, uh, just like a crash of thunder or, or a crash of something that goes on and like tracy mentioned before that gunshot there's a lot of really great comedic placements of sound and from a podcasting perspective that's something that i really enjoy yeah if we're going to jump into podcasting i think the movie may be even more relevant Mm -hmm. because of editing and i Mm -hmm. I don't want to get into all that now but i've talked about (laughs) on other shows and we have a a faculty meeting coming out very soon where quinn and i from swallows of the south get into some very deep discussions about how editing can change a production but absolutely as tracy was saying like the movie is is amazing but some of that comes from when and how the editing happened, like where they leave scenes, when they just leave silence and let things just lay there. Uh, and I've done that before. Sometimes if somebody makes a joke, I will just take out laughter. So there's like two seconds of dead air after. And other times I'll move in laughter because I think it makes more. it's better if someone guffaws at that moment. So if you're talking about editing, I think the movie is a master class in how to, how mm-hmm. to punctuate mm-hmm. and punch up jokes. Uh, so definitely should watch it there. Just watch it. It's a great movie. Uh, again, it's product of its time. We've said it before. There's a couple elements with uh, homophobia and sexism that, while not terrible, they're certainly not great, but I think they could be worse. And I think if you go into it with the right mindset, it's just so funny. There's so many one-liners that have nothing to do with either of those things. And Tim Curry's still alive. So what better reason <laughs> do you need to watch it than to, to celebrate his life before ultimately it does end? All right. <laughs> So I want to thank you both for your participation Sorry, today. Uh, as a reminder, you can find me on Twitter at the RPG Academy and all of our various shows at uh, the podcatcher of your choice. Film Studies is a new show that we're doing as a network uh, participation. So every episode will be two people from the network and a guest that we bring in from outside. So Tracy, thank you for joining us today. Uh, and I hope you will consider uh, checking back in with some of our other shows, uh, other film studies and all the other cool stuff that we do. So, Victoria, where can people find more of your work on the internet? Like I said before, the broadswords.com. Um, I'm also on another show called The Dice Unkind. Uh, my episodes haven't come up yet, though. Uh, there's a bit of a backlog before I show up. And uh, for the podcast of foes, we'll be out starting May 7th. I am the organizer for that, and that's going to be a really great time when we have 23 podcasts involved in this Wizards of the Coast uh, event. So stay tuned for that on the Dungeon Delve feed. All right. And then Tracy, how about you? Uh, Like I said, you can find me on Twitter at the other Tracy, T-R-A-C-Y. My whole portfolio of RPG work uh, is on the other Tracy.com. And I run an actual play podcast with currently four active shows uh, called the other cast. Uh, you can find it on that website as well, or just Google the other cast, all smushed together, no spaces. Um, and I just checked, we've had over 17,000 downloads across all the episodes in the little over a year. So that's extremely cool. Um, there's a Patreon. Cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's a Patreon for that. Patreon.com slash the other cast. And then I also do uh, quick start settings. Um, the next one's going to be D&D based. Uh, and you can find those at Patreon.com slash the other Tracy. And you can also find Tracy at uh, a Catacon later this year, November, as a special guest. Yeah, it's a great show. I've, I've uh, this will be the third year that I've attended, and um, 
it's convenient. It's about an hour from my house, but it's uh, <laughs> it's always uh, a good, a really good weekend to uh, to go and hang out and play games with people. Very, very cool. All right. So, any last words before we sign off? Anything we forgot, didn't mention, or I need to edit back in or change? I I just will say when you said that you you make your manor houses based off of the clue manor house, so do I. Any <laughs> manor house I have in a game is set up the way that house is. Yep. To make a long story short. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, please join us next month for Film Studies when our movie will be Delicatessen. Thanks for listening to the RPG Academy podcast, the flagship program of the RPG Academy Network. If you enjoy what we do here, then please check out the RPGacademy.com and visit our site partners for additional entertainment and gaming advice. We do this out of love for the hobby and for you, our fans. The podcast and site content will always be free for you to enjoy and utilize. But we do have expenses related to the show. If you'd like to help out in any way, please visit patreon.com slash the RPG Academy and check out the rewards we are providing for your monthly pledges. We use all funds that come in to improve the show and give you better content and quality. And if you don't have the coin to spend, don't worry. You can still help us out in many ways. You can subscribe to our show on iTunes and or Stitcher Radio. You can leave us a five-star review. Also, if you clear your cookies and you visit Amazon or the drive-thru RPG site through our portal, we get a small percentage of what you pay, and it doesn't cost you anything extra. Just like any RPG, our site works best with open lines of communication. We love talking with our listeners about everything. Please contact us with any questions, concerns, and comments that you have. We also love to hear feedback and experiences from your own games. You can email us via podcast at therpgacademy.com and reach us on social media, such as Facebook and Google Plus at The RPG Academy. But Twitter is usually the fastest way to reach us. You can find my favorite co-host, The Caleb G, at The Caleb G. And you can find my favorite co-host, Michael, at The RPG Academy. Thanks for listening. And as always, if you're having fun, you're doing it right.